Is this fine? Is it like perfect? Like is this distance fine? Okay, cool.
test, test. If everyone's done eating samosas, please don't put the plates on the floor. There's a trash can over there and up there. If you want to throw them away, please. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be standing here, so.
it's great. Is this okay? Yeah, I guess I have to project. Everyone, um, we're gonna start the event. Can everybody hear me in the back? Yes? Oh, that's so great, okay. Um, so hi, my name is um, McGill VDS Action Network, um, which organized tonight's event. Um, so thanks for coming. Um, as early settler colonialism, we wanna begin by acknowledging that we are on the traditional lands of the Ganyan Gahaga, referred to as the Mohawk peoples in colonial languages. Um, Chiochiage, the so-called island of Montreal, has also historically been a place of gathering for other indigenous peoples, particularly members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, as well as Anishinaabe. While we organize against Israeli colonialism and military occupation, we must also recognize that the reason most of us can gather here today is that this land and its people are undergoing occupation. The Canadian state was founded on the genocide of the indigenous peoples of these lands, and present state policies and legislation remain geared toward the oppression and elimination of indigenous peoples. As many of us are settlers, immigrants, or descendants of those forcefully brought to this land, it is our collective responsibility to inform and educate ourselves and each other and to resist colonialism in practice as well as its inherent whitewashing of history. Um, lastly, I'd just like to remind everyone that this Monday at 3 p.m. at SMU is our General Assembly. So the McGill BDS Action Network, as you probably know, is putting forward a motion to support BDS. Um, so SMU would uh, support BDS through the Office of the VP External and also lobby the McGill Board of Governors to divest from companies that profit from the illegal occupation of Palestine. Um, so we're sure that many of you here today are here to hear pro BDS pers oh, <laughs> that's sad. <laughs> yeah, great. Um, pro BDS perspective, maybe for the first time. Um, and we'd like to thank those of you who have given the time to think and listen about this subject. I know it's during midterms. Um, so I encourage all of you undergraduates who are here to come out and vote on Monday. Um, and please let uh, me or other organizers know if you're interested in mobilizing um, your friends and classmates. Um, yeah, so now I'd like to introduce our speaker for tonight. Um, Rabbi Michael Davis was born in England, grew up in Israel for 20 years, um, was with the clergy in Chicago for 18 years. He is a founding member of the Rabbinical Council of Jewish Voice for Peace, which is uh, on their website. They say they're a diverse and democratic community of activists inspired by Jewish tradition, to work together for peace, social justice, and human rights. They support the aspirations of Israelis and Palestinians for security and self-determination. Rabbi David Church, um, which passed their pro-BDS resolution in the summer of 2014, which is very exciting. Um, so yeah, now I'll just let him take the stage. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Chantel. Thanks to all the organizers uh, for putting this on. Thanks to all of you for coming out with uh, your midterms and uh, it's very busy here. So thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, I want to thank the committee and in particular Mohammed Anani, who was my contact and my gracious host. I came in from Chicago. Thank you. Thank you. So I come from Chicago now, uh, although my accent is originally from England by way of Israel. And um, I live in Evanston, which is a suburb just north of Chicago, the home to Northwestern University. Anybody here from Chicago or the Midwest? All right, okay. All right, where, where are you from? Uh, Glen Allen, but... Oh, cool. All right, right, it's around the neighborhood. So Northwestern, you may know, passed the BDS uh, motion um, uh, about what, a year ago or so, and I was very happy to be part of that effort. Uh, I've been working in mainstream Jewish congregations for the past 18 years since I moved to the States and only recently left, which has allowed me greater freedom to do this kind of thing. So this is my first event of this nature, so I'm very happy to be with you. And I'm going to talk a bit more about how that plays out in the Jewish community later on. So a little bit about myself. I'm going to go through a few points, and then I want to get into some Q&A, uh, hear what, what you're thinking about, and sort of engage with you know, your questions and, and what you're thinking about on this issue. So my first job as an adult was in the Israeli army, and I was working in Hasbara, which is the Hebrew word for PR on the spokesman's unit, the Israel Defense Forces Spokesman's Unit. 
Uh, and I went into the army in 1986, 87, which if you can cast back 30 years or so, that was the first intifada. And one of my jobs was to give out brochures to journalists and to uh, visiting uh, uh, foreign diplomats. And our glossiest brochure was celebrating 20 years of the civil administration, 1967 to 1987. The civil administration is the name uh, Israel gives to the uh, military control of the West Bank. And this was a, a beautiful pamphlet. It had golden corn with blue skies, and we were very proud of it. Nobody was taking it. Nobody was taking this uh, brochure. This was my first experience of trying to uh, sell the image of the reality uh, uh, to, to, to the public, and it, it, that did not go well. I lived in Israel for 20 years, and I was raised in the settler movement. I actually lived in a settlement, uh, a neighborhood of Jerusalem called Gilo. It's the southernmost Jewish area of Jerusalem. Just south of us is Beit Jala, and beyond that is Bethlehem. Number one Christmas in Bethlehem. Um, and the reality of living there uh, really sort of in, informed how I see um, just crossing over the, the Green Line, crossing over into the West Bank. We had to sort of cut through the uh, Palestinian village of Bet Safafa uh, to get to Gilo. And half of Bet Safafa was in Israel proper in the 1948 borders, and the other half was uh, across in the West Bank. The, um, so that's a little bit about myself. I, I want to start with just saying what BDS is, because in my conversations in my community, the Jewish community, I find there's a lot of um, misinformation about what BDS is. Uh, is what it actually says. I'm just going to read the the core paragraphs with the actual commitment uh, to BDS and then um, get into it a little bit. So there's a preamble and then we representatives of Palestinian civil society call upon international civil society organizations and people of conscience all over the world to impose broad, broad boycotts and implement divestment initiatives against Israel, similar to those applied to South Africa in the apartheid era. We appeal to you to pressure your respective states to impose embargoes and sanctions against Israel. We also invite conscientious Israelis to support this call for the sake of justice and genuine peace. These non-violent punitive measures should be maintained until Israel meets its obligation to recognize Palestinian people's inalienable right to self-determination and fully complies with the precepts of international law by, one, ending its occupation and colonization of all Arab lands and dismantling the wall, two, recognizing the fundamental rights of the Arab Palestinian citizens of Israel to full equality, and three, respecting, protecting, and promoting the rights of Palestinian refugees to return to their homes and properties as stipulated in UN Resolution 194. So it's important to establish that one uh, concept I'm going to bring out right here is the call to nonviolent response. Because if you were to read the, uh, the mainstream Jewish community's uh, reaction to BDS, uh, you would lose that. There's, I used to hear people saying, Where is the Palestinian Gandhi? If all the Palestinian people just got up border and pushed the border over, that would be the end of it. Where are, where's the Palestinian BDS? is, by definition, it's non-violent, right? It's, it's what we do with our pockets, it's what we do with our votes, it's not what we do with our hands or with our arms. Uh, it's, it's against violence, in fact. And this is something which uh, has been targeted by the, the, the right-wing uh, response to that. For instance, the Anti-Defamation League, the ADL, which is one of the leading uh, Jewish bodies that enforces the official line of Zionism uh, and, uh, and uh, support of Israel um, has this sentence about BDS. While supporters of the BDS movement claim to embrace the tactic as a non-violent way to pressure Israel into negotiations, the campaign is clearly a biased effort to demonize Israel. Now, I don't know how you can pack so many falsifications uh, in, in, and misrepresentations into one sentence. Let's go through it. Uh, one by one. So, while supporters of the BDS movement, this kind of, this is an insinuation here, it sort of echoes the fellow traveler 
uh, accusation against of, of the Soviet Union, right? So if we're not even going to talk about the BDS movement. These are good people who are misguided. There's a patronizing um, flavor to this right away. Why not just say the BDS movement? Well, what's this support of the BDS movement? The next is claim to embrace, already, already implying that it's false. And then the, the tactic. It, you know, BDS is not a tactic. It's a principled stand that stands uh, on its own right, as we'll see in a moment. Um, to pressure Israel into negotiations, implying that, it's, uh, uh, that Israel, um, you know, which, to which is countered that Israel is already willing to negotiate. Uh, and then the campaign is clearly a biased effort. So already kind of assuming that uh, uh, it's self-evident, um, a biased effort, all right, there's a loaded term, to demonize Israel, that's the grand finale, right? So, uh, and this is the ADL, which is a mainstream organization respected outside the Jewish community, does programs uh, throughout the community, and they've taken it upon themselves to smear the BDS campaign uh, with, with this sentence and many others. So uh, in the ADL, in its tactics for combating BDS, uh, it puts forward these talking points, and it's available on the website. They, they don't hide it. The first is to promote reconciliation between Israelis and Palestinians through constructive measures. Right? We've seen a lot about this, and the pushback against BDS is that don't boycott, rather take the money and invest it in positive measures. Now, this is really code language for, when you say constructive, it means really allowing destructive measures to go on unimpeded. That's what it actually means, right? To ignore what's actually going on. Um, they go on to say, BDS campaigns represent a hostile tactic that rests on a fundamental rejection of Israel's right to exist or defend itself. BDS does nothing to promote peace. Again, this is another distortion of language, right? Because the word peace that's used here is not how perhaps we might all agree that peace comes through justice. Lasting peace comes through really engaging people. This idea of peace is pacification, right? It's, it's peace and quiet. Um, you know, I lived, I, lived, sorry, I lived in Israel for 20 years, and I did not know any Palestinians during my time there. I had to come to America and get involved in peace work here to, to meet the Palestinians who were already living there. I entered Palestinian areas as an Israeli soldier carrying a gun. I entered Israeli areas as a settler with people carrying guns. I entered Palestinian areas with the privilege of being an Israeli, with having that aura of uh, protection of just being uh, an Israeli Jew entering those areas. But I never felt more safe in Palestinian areas when I went back after I'd moved here with a is wonderful Israeli Jewish peace group, and we were welcomed in as guests, right? There's nothing more secure than having the other person welcome you into their home, rather than going in with guns and force and privilege. So when the ADL says that BDS does nothing to promote peace, of course, the opposite is true. The, um, it has more talking points. I don't, I don't want to spend too much time on the ADL. Um, but um, you know, their, their website makes for interesting reading. So I want to move on to, the ADL is just one of many groups that is imposing the, um, the official line that BDS is violent, that BDS is wrong, that BDS uh, seeks to demonize Israel. The other one relates to your lives in, on campus, right? Hillel, right? Uh, Hillel International uh, issued guidelines in 2010 that Hillel, the Jewish fraternity on campus, will not partner with, house, or host organizations, groups, or speakers that as a matter of policy or practice, one, deny the right of Israel to exist as a Jewish and democratic state with secure and recognized borders, two, delegitimize, demonize, or apply a double standard to Israel, support, boycott of, divestment from, or sanction against the state of Israel, and three, exhibit a pattern of disruptive behavior towards campus events or guest speakers or foster an atmosphere of incivility. Right. So uh, all of these are very, very problematic. Uh, the first one I want to go after is the idea of Israel as Jewish and democratic. So uh, I joked about this with my Catholic friends. <laughs> Catholics have... Any Catholics here? Oh, fantastic. Okay. So... Uh, 
the Catholic faith has right uh, the the the, uh, the mystery of transubstantiation, right? The mystery of the Trinity in one, mysteries which are religious mysteries, right? Religious, that, we, that we behold and contemplate on. Every religion has them. In my faith, Judaism, we have our own mysteries, but Zionism has its mystery, and this mystery is called Jewish and democratic. I once, <laughs> I once challenged a rabbi friend of mine about what does that mean? What does that mean? And he responded in religious terms. He said to me that, um, you know, it's for us to work out. <laughs> so the failing is in us that we are not unable to comprehend the mystery. The mystery stands on its own. So, uh, you know, e either you're a theocratic, ethnocratic state, or you're a democratic state. The, the two cannot coexist. And then to put the blame on those who don't accept that uh, for failing to understand that feels to, coming from a sort of a, a religious world of perhaps a previous generation. Um, so the, 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 the point about um, demonizing, I mean, we've already talked about this, this inflammatory language, the double standard, right, uh, that's not true. And that's actually something very exciting about what's going on right now. And I heard a little bit about what's going on at McGill. And I know that we're doing this work in Jewish Voice for Peace, which is uh, the fancy word we use for this is intersectionality. Are, are you using that word? Right, okay, so, so the idea of partnering, right, that all these uh, issues are really connected. They're connected because they come from a, a common sense of humanity, of standing for human rights. Um, and they're connected because we can tactically help each other. Uh, and it's also, I think, it's, it's responding to the other side's campaign of pinkwashing and greenwashing and faithwashing and general whitewashing, right? The idea of sort of trying to bury uh, the Israel issue un uh, under other things and say, well, look, look how many uh, gays there are in Tel Aviv, uh, et cetera. Look at women of the war. Look how women are treated in Israel as opposed to Arab countries. All these arguments are ways of, are like the shadow of intersectionality. Intersectionality is saying, let's engage with those issues, let's talk to those people, let's come together and work together rather than co-opting their voice and saying that we're speaking for them. So in a way it's, it's responding to those tactics by saying we're going to uh, deal with these with integrity and coming from a shared commitment to human rights. I just want to say, oh, oh sorry, I should, I should stop doing that. Um, <laughs> Okay, I, I'm Jewish, I talk with my hands, I'll just stand back about it. So, Jewish Voice of Peace, the organization that I'm part of, um, represents 200,000 uh, members and supporters around the world, mostly in the US, um, and the group within Jewish Voice of Peace that I work with closely is the Rabbinical Council, which I'm a founding member of. There are about 35 of us on the council. We're a collegial group, we support each other. Uh, my colleagues are doing some really exciting things. Uh, we, we cover a range of generations of uh, rabbis who are retired to rabbinical students, men, women, uh, LGBTQ. We have, we're really, we represent a, a broad spectrum um, and also a different denominations, different levels of traditional adherence uh, within Judaism. Uh, and what we're finding Contrary to perhaps what you might be hearing through the propaganda of the other side is that it's precisely those Jews who are very connected to their Judaism who are joining Jewish Voice for Peace, right? It's actually those Jews who grew up in Jewish day schools, who have connections to synagogues, um, who are deeply rooted in their Jewish practice and Jewish uh, faith and family ties who are uh, doing this work. In fact, um, we're discovering that the adult children of some of the leaders of the other side are activists in Jewish Voice for Peace. And I'm actually starting a, 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 a doing an interview program now of interviewing the parent and the adult child. The parent is a mainstream rabbi or employee of the Jewish community. Who, uh, part of their job is enforcing a certain line. And their adult child is a staffer for Jewish Voice for Peace, is an activist and so on. And um, hearing their stories, how they manage that relationship as a way of modeling how we can talk across political divides and normalize this generational shift that is happening. Because part of my commitment as a rabbi 
is to maintain the integrity of the relationships and to find ways to affect change within the relationships. And I think there's a lot of rich work that can be done uh, through that. Uh, and I can say more about that later if, if you're interested in that. Um, so, my take on what the key problem with BDS for the mainstream community is number three, it's the right of return. Most Jews that I know, most people that I know, don't, don't have a problem with the first call, right? Um, the end the occupation. That, that's a mainstream um, idea that uh, occupying the West Bank is untenable, it's wrong, it needs to end, we need to figure out how. The second call for equal rights within Israel, that perhaps doesn't have such broad uh, support, but it's pretty broad. Uh, most Americans would, would say, yeah, I mean, equal rights under the law, you know, it's a no-brainer, right? It's when we get to the third one, which is the right of return, where it gets complicated. And I want to come at this from, uh, from some compassion for those who are still in that place, because I was once there, people you know are still there, and we're all sort of dealing with layers of perhaps unreflected prejudice or identity, and it's, it's not easy to unpack that, and people have real concerns, and I think my way of affecting change is, is to try and do that within the relationship, and to, 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 at least to understand where they're coming from. Even if you're coming in a more aggressive way, knowing what's going on in their heads and their hearts can be helpful to having an effective conversation. So the, the concern about the right of return, of course, is that what will happen if millions of Palestinians, right, the Nakba involved 750,000 to 800,000 Palestinians, now we're talking about three generations on, we're talking about millions, if they all were allowed in under the right of return, it would swamp the state of Israel, and it, and it would change the character, and, and there would be a, a, a very big majority of Palestinians against Israelis. It, it, would, it would be untenable for the Jewish Israelis, they'll never agree to this, and so on and so forth. Now, this, this is a concern that many Jewish people have in an honest way, right? They, when they say that it's not a strategy, it's not a ploy, it's what they really think and believe in their hearts. One response to that is uh, that work has been done uh, to show that the right of return can work, right? just on the level of practicality. I mean, do you know the name Salman Abu Sita? Uh, so he's, he's a Palestinian academic who's done work showing that, um, first of all, most Palestinians will choose not to go back uh, or not to exercise that right. So that's already we're talking about low numbers. And even those who, who might come back accommodations can be made. Uh, the, the reason why many won't go back is that a lot of the villages don't exist, right? There's, a, there's kind of a local uh, loyalty to, to a place, and those places don't exist. They're under Israeli towns. They, uh, there's nothing there to go back to. So the numbers would be low, and even those who would go back, there would be ways to accommodate that. So people have done the work of, figure out, uh, of figuring this out. But, uh, but what, what I, this whole idea of what people are thinking uh, is actually a, a broader issue, and which I've still put under the label of reality versus fantasy. Right? People have this idea that um, several ideas they hold which are just not true. The first one is that Israel is predominantly Jewish. Right? It's already a Jewish state. That is not true. Between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean, which is the land that Israel controls, the, the uh, de facto one state, which is already there, um, it's 50-50. So, so that already is untrue. The idea that, that it's a Jewish state, that Jews were, were always there because 2,000 years ago there was a Jewish presence and so on, that was 2,000 years ago. That's a fantasy that people actually believe that to be true, that it is Jewish, that it is predominantly Jewish. Another fantasy that people hold on to is the idea of anti-Semitism. That you, all of you, and me, are motivated by anti-Semitism. That so we hate Jews. I mean, that's patently false in my case. <laughs> it's patently false in the people I know and work with. Uh, and it, we are committed to fighting racism. Anti-Semitism is antithetical to that. It doesn't, it's not true. But people believe that fantasy to be true and it's false, as we can demonstrate over and over again. 
The, the final thing is, um, which I think feeds into this in America, is the Islamophobia that, um, that I apologize for Donald Trump uh, uh, as an American citizen. Um, and I'm horrified, as I'm sure all of you are, uh, for his, uh, his candidacy that's legitimized views that should never be made public. Um, and th th this is a real problem. I was, uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I, were, I visited with um, a Muslim high school, which was last week, a Muslim high school in Chicago, in Bridgeview, lots of Palestinians there. Uh, and the kids asked me, they said, you know, what do you, th what do you think about Donald Trump? You know, they, they feel really uh, scared about what's going on. And that Islamophobia is very much a part of this um, anti-Palestinian uh, campaign. I want to go on to um, another, um, well, here, here at McGill. So Hillel at McGill, you, uh, anybody here from Hillel? No? Okay. Uh, anybody know any contacts with Hillel? All right. So, so, so okay. So, so I, I was on the website. Uh, Hillel is supposed to be uh, the Jewish home, the home for Jewish people on campus. But it's actually, in effect, it's, uh, it's a leading organization organizing pro-Israel campaigns and organizing against, against the BDS motion, among other things. I don't know what they're doing right now. Um, unless you know more than I do. But on their website, uh, on January 27th, Hillel Montreal hosted a Massa Israel event. Massa is one of the many state-funded programs that bring young Jewish adults to Israel to inculcate a meaningful relationship between the world's Jews and the state of Israel. That's from their website. Um, and, and there are other programs on the website which show how uh, Hillel is used and uses their resources to, to fight BDS and, and to fight Palestinian human rights. So, so when I was at this um, Muslim high school, one of the questions that the students asked me was, Rabbi, you lived in Israel. You tell us you could see the, uh, the evidence of the Nakba. I used to walk around uh, Gilo and uh, Mabasera, the other place I lived, and you could see in, you know, in the, among the trees, among the Jewish National Fund forest trees, you could see broken rows of stones. You could see the outlines of the old villages. Um, walking to Jerusalem on the main highway from Tel Aviv, on the left, there are these abandoned stone houses. This is the Palestinian village of Lifta, which, which is there to see. You can see it's, a Palestinian, it's an abandoned Palestinian village standing there as a monument right as you enter Jerusalem. Everywhere you go, you can see evidence of what was once there. So people say, they ask the question, how did you not come to this earlier? How did you not see what you were seeing? And what I told them was that you can see and not know what you are seeing. If you don't have the concepts, if you don't have the framework, if you don't have the emotional connection, then you can see and it can just not connect. Right? We have a limited bandwidth, we have a limited areas of concern, and the word Nakba didn't exist when I was growing up. Right? Uh, in the United States, and I'm sure in Canada, there are all sorts of issues that are burning issues that are at the forefront, and people aren't seeing them. In fact, the issues that you all stand for, I'm sure that lots of other people kind of say, yeah, I know it's not great, but, or it doesn't really connect, right? So um, I say this from a place of compassion for the other people we're trying to sway, for my friends who are still aren't there, is that you can, you can see the evidence and not make the connection. And we, do, we all do that every day uh, in other areas of life. So, um, so I want to talk a little bit, um, I'm touching a lot of different things, and I'll, I'll, when we take the questions, we'll see what you want to talk about after that, is on my particular group uh, of, of rabbis, and why I think it's important to talk about rabbis and to focus on that. So the, the lock on the conversation about Israel is enforced by um, Jewish organizations, uh, some Jewish organizations, a lot of the mainstream Jewish organizations, but the actual sort of ideological push for this outside of uh, those organizations comes from my colleagues, the rabbis. And I want to share a couple of stories to illustrate that. 
a few months ago, I was at um, a planning session to sort of brainstorm what we might do in the Jewish community to revolutionize Jewish education. And we had the rabbis and cantors and synagogue presidents and all sorts of people who are very involved in this uh, from the Chicago and Milwaukee area. We were broken up into about 11 breakout groups. And we were told, come up with a list of things that you would do if money was no issue and if political will was no issue. You can do whatever you want, just brainstorm. We took a butcher paper and made a whole list. Then we came together, 11 groups. The number one on all those 11 groups was trips to Israel. The number one of all the 11 groups, and they hadn't spoken to each other. How is that possible that every single group came back with the same answer? I'll give you another example. Last year, I organized for my colleagues in Chicago, the Reform Rabbis and Cantors, a dialogue session to try and sort of talk about issues about Israel. I felt it was important uh, for me because to create more space um, for dialogue, I need to sort of promote the, the kind of this, the, the, there's a, a space to talk about things. We had breakout sessions. Every single, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to stand over here. Every single group, aside from mine, said, ah, it was boring. We didn't need to meet. We all agree anyway. The only group that said it was interesting was my group, because I was there. <laughs> I was the only one of the group. Which speaks to the fact that we are a minority, a small minority, but it also speaks to the fact that there is a conformity of opinion. In fact, within the Jewish community, to get into leadership and to speak for the Jewish community, you have to speak th this line about Israel. And it's not about uh, brainwashing or ideology, it's almost an identity issue. It's an identity issue. Israel is the glue that has held the Jewish community together. I don't know what it's like in Montreal or Canada, but in Chicago and, and in America and the United States, you can know that you're outside a synagogue by the sign that says, we stand with Israel. So within the Jewish community, whether you're the most traditional, the people with the black hats, well, maybe not just before them, and all the way to the most, to the humanists, to the atheists, what unites, what unites them? The only ideology is Israel. That is, the, that is the only ideology that unites the entire community. It's a little bit like um, Italy, an example from politics. Israel, Italy, after World War II, had a problem. They just had this civil war between the fascists and the communists, and they had to put the country together. They needed an institution that would do that. Who did they turn to? The one institution that could do that, that could bring the country together, was the Catholic Church. You go to Italy, many Italians are just as liberal as North Americans. They, 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 they're very relaxed. Um, sexual matters and all the things that are sort of markers of sort of a, an open society. But you look around, there are Catholic symbols everywhere, crucifixes and so on, uh, everywhere. Hospitals, uh, apartment buildings. Officially, Catholicism is occupying this place where privately people are not there. And the reason is because of this need at the end of World War II to create an institution that would hold that space publicly that the people could come together, even if people would chafe against that or not be part of that. That's a very sort of broad analysis. But similarly in the Jewish community, the one thing that holds together the humanists and, and, the, um, and the, the devout believers those who are liberal Democrats and those who vote Republican, the one thing that sort of an idea that can hold everybody together is standing for Israel. So, so Israel serves a, a vital function. And it's not even Israel again, it's the fantasy of Israel. But what I find fascinating again and again is that when I talk to people, is that those who actually spent time in Israel and are connected actually are less bothered by BDS and things like that than those for whom Israel is some kind of projection, some need for some glue, some, some identity that is perhaps otherwise wouldn't be there. Um, so one example of this is that there was a, um, a few years ago, there was a bit of a debate uh, in sort of my rabbinic community because American rabbinical students, and rather I train rabbis in Chicago, but most rabbinical students go to Israel for one year. And the problem was, that the students came back from Israel less Zionist than when they went there. 
So they were sent there to come back with sort of more, to be more connected. I mean, to learn and to benefit from the wonderful Jewish resources in Israel, of course, but also to come back as ambassadors uh, for Zionism. And they were coming back just the opposite. The more they got to the reality behind the fantasy, the less committed they were to the ideology. Uh, and this, uh, Dr. Daniel Gordis of the Shalem Center spoke out publicly about this and so on. So that I say that to support your campaign because reality is on our side. Right? It's a matter of stripping away the, the need for this fantasy, the need for these projections, and just witnessing what is, uh, which is what brings people to action, together with the concepts that help people see it. So, um, a, few, a, few other, a few other things about, about why, why BDS. So, uh, when, I, when I was at this Muslim school last week, I asked the students, said, have you heard of BDS? And only a handful raised their hands. So this is a Palestinian Muslim school, and they hadn't heard of BDS. What, who are we doing this for? Right? And what I think is important to know is that BDS is not for Palestinians, it's for the rest of us. It's, for, it's, uh, it's not only for Palestinians, it's for the rest of us. It's, a lot of the Palestinian community are immigrants. They've got their own uh, fights to fight. Um, BDS is a way for us, middle class people, um, working class, upper middle class, the Americans, North Americans, a way of us of connecting with them and of acting uh, here as citizens to support them over there. The so so I, I'm going to end with actually going to get to the title finally, a moral case for BDS, which is that why I do this work and why why I think it's important to do this work. And I'll start with something I saw today. So I had a few hours today to do some sightseeing. And I went to the cathedral in uh, an old Montreal. I, 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 I should know the name. The big, massive, beautiful, beautiful cathedral. Is that Notre Dame? Huh? Yeah. And, and it, was, it was gorgeous. And, and they, I noticed that the, there's this, the preacher's pulpit. I mean, it must have a technical term. But with this beautiful wooden uh, spiral staircase. And underneath that, there is a statue of two biblical prophets. There's a trivia question. You're all from here. No, there's this thing that tourists do. Okay, so there's the prophet Ezekiel and the prophet Jeremiah seated under the preacher, but almost like sort of giving the preacher this inspiration of what to say. And I've been thinking about this because in, in the Jewish tradition, we lift out from the Bible certain prophets and not so much others, right? The Bible's a big book, it's actually 24 books. But what we actually read and what people know and uh, gets into the prayer book and into the services is a small part of what is there. And there is a bias towards the prophet Isaiah. I'm not sure you knew that, I'm not sure it's helpful information, but it's, it's, it's what we do. We read from the prophet Isaiah more than any other prophet. The prophet Isaiah is the one who gives us uh, the lamb will lay down with the wolf, uh, they shall beat their swords into plowshares. All sorts of inspirational messages, messages of comfort, comfort ye my people, all those uh, visions of a prophetic time, of a peaceful time, of a, of a good time. But Jeremiah is the prophet of lament and woe, right? So I'm Jeremiah, right? It's the, he's the prophet of lamentations. Ezekiel is the prophet of envisioning a future that is not necessarily comforting. Uh, uh, rebuilding a uh, future. And I, I, I think that we need to be looking to those prophets more to the, the prophets of comfort. We need the prophets of discomfort, the prophets of reality, of harsh reality. That's what a prophet is. A prophet is someone who says, what you're seeing right now, that's not all there is. Something else is coming. There's a reality beyond what's presenting itself. A reality beyond the fantasy that we're in. A reality beyond the the sleep state that perhaps we might be in. It's a reality that we can awaken to. And I think that's something that, that we need to be doing. The, the, the second grounding I want to bring from a Jewish point of view is I am uh, privileged beyond anything that previous generations of my family ever knew or could have dreamed of. My grandfather narrowly escaped being killed in a pogrom in 1905. 
My mother is a Holocaust survivor. My, all my ancestors were poor. There's no famous names in my uh, family tree. And here I am living in, this, in American suburbia, uh, very fortunate, very blessed. And I think that the arc of my life is uh, shared by many, many people, many Jews, and, and not just. And it's a wonderful problem to have, but the specific problem in terms of being Jewish for me is that the moral imperative in, uh, in Judaism, in the prayer book, in, in tradition, for going out and doing justice, for being, uh, fulfilling commandments is, remember that you were slaves in the land of Egypt. Therefore, you should do this. It repeats over and over and over again in the Bible and brought out in liturgy every single day, several times a day. Remember that you were slaves in the land of Egypt. Now, for my grandparents and great-grandparents and so on, that wasn't a problem, right? Because their lives were close to, to, to slavery. They lived in abject poverty, they didn't have political rights, and so on and so forth. So when they said, remember that you were slaves in the land of Egypt, that, that they were connected to that reality. But how am I connected to that reality? How can I even begin to envision that? How can I even be Jewish in the way that they were Jewish? How can I even connect to the past? How, 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 how does that happen? And the answer for me is, to act in solidarity with those who are still in that situation. That's how you, you do that, right? So, so, for instance, the first domestic social justice project I was privileged to be a part of was for the Hyatt Hotel Workers. And we heard of that campaign a few years ago? Okay. So, well, well, it, was in, it was in Chicago. The, the global headquarters are in Chicago, so it's a local thing. But it had implications globally. And I got to go and sit with workers, many of whom were middle class immigrant women of color. And it was really heartwarming how they let their guard down, me, a middle class white man from, the, from suburbia, when I came and sat with them when I was willing to stand in solidarity with them. That's all it took. So that expanded my world, right? And it made me connected to a world that otherwise I wouldn't have. I'd be in my little bubble and, and with you know, all the issues around that, sort of distrust and so on. So acting in solidarity with others connects us deeply to others, and it, uh, and it expands our human experience. So that, I'm selling that, uh, an argument for doing this kind of work. The, um, there, there is some Jewish source for, um, for boycotting businesses that act unfairly, but not that much. It must be said, honestly, there isn't that much in Jewish tradition that, uh, that, that directly supports this work. But I think that, that the reason why this is so important for me to do as a rabbi, and I'm selling this to, to other Jews for the same uh, idea, is that something fundamental has changed in what it means to be Jewish. And it's not just socioeconomic success, it's not just um, political success, it's actually the changing society of which we're all a part. The walls have come down between religious communities, right? The 30% uh, of Americans, of you Asians, I should say, to be politically correct in this group, uh, practice a religion that they were not born into. Right? People are moving around. Uh, how, how many of you have somebody in your extended family who is of a faith other than the one than yours or, or lack of? I mean, right, pretty much every hand in the room, right? At my family's Seder table, um, half the men around the table are not Jewish. Right? Interfaith is a reality in the Jewish community which means it's a reality in every community, right? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a modern reality. It's actually, not only is it a reality, it's actually put forward as a value, right? So, whereas in the past, marrying within the faith was set forth as the ideal, now, and it's quite recent, interfaith has become something to aspire to. Not being interfaith is actually kind of not so great. So, this poses all sorts of challenges into how we understand who we are and and for me as a rabbi, it's things to work through. But it puts the pressure on Israel to come to terms with that reality, right? Because Israel is set up where endogamy, right, the fancy word for, for not marrying out of the faith, is actually enforced by the state. So, so, so the more we go forward, the more we develop, the more we open up to each other here, the more that appears so anachronistic. And our support of that 
is so anachronistic. So yes, we have an agenda here of bringing Israel into the fold. And I say this as a Jew, as a rabbi, and as an Israeli, that it hurts me to see Israel bur burrowing itself deeper and deeper into this anachronistic place and, and more, uh, moving further and further away from the rest of the world that's moving forward. So this is something that we're doing to expand our, our human experience and to embrace Israel into that experience. Uh, which is uh, part of my motivation for doing this work. Um, so why BDS? BDS educates people about the issues. It puts the issues on the table. BDS has tremendous success it's, and it's growing. There's a whole list of the BDS movement website. It's pages, I printed it out, pages and pages uh, of, of um, successes. BDS victories, it's very fine print. See all this? It's just, um, it's, it's several pages of, of, of you, can, you can look at that uh, on the website. BDS is a non-violent response to a violent system. There's a campaign to organize society around the principle in response to the society that is organized around violent oppression. And BDS is not for the Palestinians, it's for us. So I want to leave with one final thought and then take your questions and continue the conversation. Um, and I said this at an interfaith rally that we had at a St. Pat's Church, Old St. Pat's Church in Chicago last week. Violence diminishes the victim. Violence diminishes the perpetrator. Violence diminishes the bystander. And our response is to come together. We will not be bystanders. We will stand against the perpetrators, and we stand with the victims. Go vote for BDS. Thank you. Somebody moderating? <laughs> um, thank you so much for that talk again. Let's give a round of applause. Thank you. All right. Um, so here how, here's the, how this is going to happen. We're going to take one or two questions at a time, and then I'm going to repeat the question for the live stream, and then Rabbi Michael Davis will free, feel free to answer sort of any part of the question. So we're going to start with Julia, and we're going to go over there. Yeah. Um, so the question that was posed was, how do we combat the um, bias in mainstream media for Israel and against Palestinians? Yes. So I'm not sure I, ha I, you know, if I had the magic bullet, then you know, we would have solved it already, right? But some tactics is, some people are, you can't talk to, right? There's no point in putting you any, we have limited energy, right? As activists or as just things we can And I don't talk about this issue with lots of people because I know that nothing good's going to come of that. So you've got to pick your battles and the people you talk to. Some people just say, just move on. You know. um, but the people who are progressive on many issues but not on this, and we have a term for it, it's called PEP. Have you heard that term before? Progressive except Palestine. Um, <laughs> so uh, so and, and I'm working for PIP, progressive including Palestine. Right? So, so maybe pivot off that, you know, of say, you start with their commitments to other things and, and explain how this fits into that. But the, nothing beats um, your personal commitment in showing up, like having the conversation, right? I mean, the mainstream media is very powerful because it fills people's heads with ideas, but it's more powerful when you show up in people's face and you're there in, in the relationship. So, yeah, again, I'd organize the group called the Open Hillel Rabbinical Council, which stands for opening up the Hillel uh, um, and for allowing free debate within the Jewish community. And I went to a whole bunch of rabbis I know, and I remember one of them said to me, he said, oh, I'm not, you know, you know, I'm not going to do it. And I said to him, really? You're going to say no to me? So I, I really leaned on him through our relationship. And he signed. He wasn't going to sign. So it's all about relationships. Right? People have a relationship to the mainstream media. You have a relationship with them. You know, which one's stronger? How do you strengthen that relationship? So that's all the intersectionality. That's 
caring about what they care about and being truly interested. Um, you know, I mean, the, all these things about not being judgmental, sort of really being curious and being compassionate. Like why, people have reasons why they hold on to what they think. And they're not going to change because I or you or anybody else says you're wrong. In fact, that's the, that's, that's the worst thing to, to think even, right? You really got to get into their heads and really be compassionate and really hear them and perhaps learn something. Um, I, uh, I organized at my old synagogue a, a, a dialogue session about Israel. And one of the big wins for me was that one of the uh, women in, in the synagogue got to speak freely about why she cares so much. Because we came from an uh, attitude of curiosity. And I got to hear a side of her I'd never seen before. And I got to love her more because she was talking from the heart about why she cares. That was a win. If you just start with that. You've got to build relationships to get to, to, uh, to win people over. And, and, it, and if people smell that you, you want to change them, then the conversation's over. But, but I don't know if anybody else has any other brilliant ideas, you know, because nobody's cracked it yet, but you, you just keep trying it in different ways. Okay, yeah. Um, okay, we're going to take a question up there. Um, I'm sorry, we're really short on time. If you want to, one, one more sure, we just have to take other other questions, please. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. Okay. Yeah, sure if you would... I, I really think you have to, but I'm going to be losing track of all the points. <laughs> let, let, let me just let me respond to where you get, get so far, and then <laughs> let, 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 let me respond to so far, and then say. Okay. I'm 
I, I'm, fami I'm familiar with the argument, Rabbi. I want to, I want to thank you, first of all, for Shmuley. Well, Michael, uh, first I want to thank you for coming out, because, uh, um, you know, you knew you'd be a minority, uh, and, uh, and thank you for, for uh, Hebrew sort of say, the Derek Eretz of, of coming out and, and for the way you presented yourself, too. Um, I'm not sure I remember everything you said, but I, I, I'm, not, I'm not claiming that we speak for all Jews, and neither you, of course, and I, I did see that we're a minority. Um, I'm countering the accusation that's been put out there that Jewish Voice for Peace is only sort of leveraging the Jewish thing to achieve a certain end or is uh, crafting certain rituals uh, and so on. And what I'm finding is that, um, of course, my, my experience is anecdotal well as is yours, is that the people are coming there in great pain. You know, I organized um, a memorial service in 2014 during Protective Edge, and we, we read Eicha. Lamentations on Tisha B'Av, the ninth of Av, uh, which is the Jewish morning, the day of mourning, and I chanted from the Book of Lamentations, and we, ch we mourned for the victims in Gaza, who were being killed as we spoke. We also mourned for our lost relationships, for family and friends who no longer talk to us or whom we have difficult relationships because of this difficult conversation. And there were real tears in that room. I don't think I've ever observed a holiday with greater integrity than that moment. Now. The numbers, Jewish Voice of Peace is growing by leaps and bounds. As a result of Protective Edge, I think 40,000 uh, joined just in a few months after that. Money poured in at a rate that um, exceeded anything that happened before without, without any kind of campaign. Uh, I don't, um, the, the new chapters opened, the number, the number of chapters doubled. Jewish Voice of Peace, um, f uh, was it five years ago, had four employees. Now they're up to 28 and going to 29. What other nonprofit, not much of the Jewish community anywhere, grows sevenfold uh, in, in such a short period of time? So uh, the trend is 200,000. The trend is just, it, it's, it's growing. And on the other side, I worked in the mainstream Jewish community, and the numbers are stagnant. The reason why we had that breakout session, which I referenced, was because there's panic in the Jewish community that the numbers are shrinking. The growth. The extraordinary growth is over here, and, and and I say this like you as a concerned rabbi, that the and maybe I'm sure Chabad is different, but in the liberal Jewish community, that is the case. The numbers are stagnant, and there's, and there's deep concern about this. And what, what what the problem I think one the the problem that can be solved through this work is that people like me are stigmatized in the Jewish community. The doors are locked shut. So in the Jewish community, and this is a very Jewish conversation two rabbis are having, but you can listen in. Uh, the, the Jewish community is, uh, is saying, we're desperate that we're shrinking, but no, 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 you can't come in because you have the wrong opinions on, on Israel. That, that's what's going on. Uh, and these Jews, my, my fellow activists, uh, many of them say we can't enter any synagogue. We do not feel welcome in any synagogue. Now, regarding anti-Semitism and BDS, this is a, an argument that we hear a lot, and I've written about this in Huffington Post and so on. So yes, there, there is a small amount of real anti-Semitism, which we, were all, we all denounce. But the lion's share, by far, of the so-called anti-Semitism is anti-Semitism. It's the fantasy again. If you are a Jewish student who, who says, I stand for Israel, and you're attacked, for your views on Israel, that's not anti-Semitism. And if you feel uncomfortable because of that, that feeling is not anti-Semitism. That feeling is you've identified with a political idea and you're being made to feel uncomfortable because you, you, oh, oh. But you're losing that. I, 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 know, I know what anti-Semitism is. I prayed in a synagogue in Manchester and stones came through the window. My mother's a Holocaust survivor. That's anti-Semitism. Right? Anti-Semitism is not standing for Israel and then being told, being reminded of what's going on and so forth. So the fact that a Jewish student feels uncomfortable does not make it anti-Semitism. Right? So, uh, so we, have to, we have to be very clear on our, on our definitions. Now, if there is some anti-Semitism here and there, that should be denounced, and it is denounced loudly. But to try and tar the entire movement because of that, when we all loudly denounce, if you denounce anti-Semitism, would you applaud? The leaders, the leaders, the leaders of the PDS 
BDS movement. The, the leaders of the BDS movement have gone out of their way, Ali Abu Nim, Omar Barghouti, to denounce anti-Semitism, right? The, the movement is essentially anti-racist. Uh, anti now, to, to, tr to demand of them every single day to say what picture has been posted to the BDS feed, which is anti-Semitic, which I've seen, and you've got to stand and denounce that every single day, is to try to chain them to this accusation to limit their freedom to do what they do. They've made it clear, they've made it clear over and over again, uh, the leaders made it clear, the membership made it clear, this is an anti-racist movement, and it, it denounces anti-Semitism, and how can I and all <coughs> many of other rabbis be so committed to this work if that were not the case? Thank you. Thank you. Um, i just like to make two points. Um, J Street is actually a very moderate institution. It advocates for a two-state solution. And saying BDS is anti-Semitic actually marginalizes a lot of anti-Zionist Jews who uh, are present within Megillah BDS and also within this room. So let's give them a round of applause as well. Um, do you have another question in the room? Sorry, someone else who hasn't spoken yet. Um, yeah, go ahead, over there. Um, so the question is directed to the rabbi about how he envisions Israel to be in the future. Okay. I don't heard three states before. I thought it was Dr. Seuss when he said that. One state, two state, three state. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, well, the standard response is, you know, it's not for us to decide how they figure it out, right? It's for us to stand for human rights, right? Um, the other response is that focusing on a future political settlement, which may or may not happen now or in the future, well, it's not going to happen now, but in the distant future, deflects our attention from what's going on right now, which is the urgent need to stand for human rights. So, and I feel as a religious person, that's what I can do, right? I'm not a politician, right? I stand for people's humanity. So during the war in Gaza, Protective Edge, what I did when we said Kaddish, when we said the Jewish memorial service, uh, I said, uh, I think we lost the rabbi, okay. Um, so, um, so the... Uh, we, we said the names of Palestinians who have been killed. Right? We stand for the common humanity. You know, that, that's enough. Right? If we accomplish that, that, that's enough. I mean, of course, my vision, my hope would be that Israel is a place which doesn't have laws that discriminate against non-Jews. Israel is a place that can be at peace. Right? I mean, I fear for my family. Right? And I don't think peace is going to come by living on the sword, which is what Netanyahu and so on promise. And, and a war every two years. From a, as a Jewish perspective, sending young men to the slaughter every year, Jewish men, the soldiers I'm talking about, not even part of the Palestinian side. So from a very narrow Jewish perspective, the only, the only long-term security for Israelis will be through this work. So that's what I pray for, that's what I hope for. How they figure that out, federation, confederation, anarchy, whatever, they, they'll, they'll, they'll do that, but, but they've got to be able to come to the table knowing that the, the world's got their back, the Palestinians, you know, so they can do that. Uh, I mean, it's already a one state right now, right? So, but I think a lot of this conversation is an attempt to suck up our time and energy on that rather than looking at what is right now. Yeah. All right, any other questions in the room up there? Yeah. Oh, that is the memorial service where we right. relationships, strained relationships, and so on. That was the Kaddish, that was more the lamentations, yeah. Did you say Kaddish for the IDF soldiers? And did you also yes. say Kaddish? Did you say Kaddish for the people who are getting slaughtered in the streets right now? Yes, we did. We did. We said, and I thought it was very important to me to say that, to remember all those who are being killed. I mean, I have to have compassion for myself. I was an Israeli soldier for three years, and I could have been one of them. I mean, I remember going into, I was in the reserves and went down to Gaza in May '94. For the first pullout, and I was there in a uniform. I, I mean, I'm not. A, I don't look like a soldier now. I didn't look like a soldier then either. But, <laughs> but you put a uniform on somebody that looked like a soldier. They are a soldier. I was a soldier, and um, and so so I could have been them. So if I'm going to have compassion on my younger self, then I need to have compassion for them. And I think that in, in many ways we're talking about teenagers, right? So what's, what's a soldier? 18, 19, right? 
so, the, I mean, the true perpetrators are the, the older men and women in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv who are sending them on these missions. They're the ones who should be held to account. But the, so the, but the ones who are, we, we, we mourn human life. We mourn the, the, the few Israelis who died. Uh, and, and this was controversial. When I was in a Palestinian setting, I didn't mention the soldiers because um, that would have been too inflammatory. I mean, they, they are the ones who are doing the killing. But in a Jewish setting, I did. And that's a line that I draw. Uh, but I certainly have in mind that these young men are children of friends of mine. Uh, they could have been me. Uh, but I do show some sensitivity when I'm not in a Jewish setting about that because they're also the ones who are doing the killing. So it's a difficult line. But in my heart, I feel for them too. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions from the room? Um, all right, seeing none, I'd like to thank everyone for coming out. I know it's really cold and everyone's really tired and has midterm, so thank you so much for staying with us for this hour and a half. Thank you. Um, and there's the donation box that's being passed around, actually. I can hear the coins clinking in the box, so if you can, <laughs> if you'd like to wait for that, um, we greatly appreciate the support. Um, I'd also like to remind everyone that this event is a part of a larger event series. Tomorrow we're having a Palestine short film festival in this very room at 6 p.m. Um, the films are from Gaza and the West Bank, and the total is going to be about an hour and a half. So even if you have any assignment to your final, please try to come, take a study break, come watch a movie with us. Um, and then Saturday, we're having a concert for justice uh, at Café L'Arterre on Jean Talon Park at 8 p.m. It's an open mic, and it's not Palestine-centric, so if you know any performers, or if you'd like to hear some spoken word, please come and bring your performing friends along so they can have some you know, time for themselves on stage. And again, thank you. Let's get a round of applause for Rabbi Michael. <laughs> Thank you, you've been a great audience. It's been one of us, my first uh, event doing this at a university, so I'm really grateful that you came out and for your good attention. And, and good luck on Monday. I'll be praying for you in Chicago. Good luck. <laughs>